have a question for you. Have you ever played hide-and-seek? Maybe the better question would be, has anyone who is here never played hide-and-seek? Probably began for most of us when we were still babes in arms. Then it was mom and dad, and grandparents, uncles and aunts peekabooing us, which when you think of it is an infant form of hide-and-seek. And then as we get older and our bodies became stronger and our legs could carry us about, we went on to the real thing, playing hide-and-seek with siblings, with playmates, maybe at times even with mom and dad. It's a children's game, of course, or should we rather say a rather childish game. And when you think of it also, it's a game that we really haven't given up. Just that we've gone on to bigger things now. Now we spend a goodly bulk of our time trying to hide from God. Spend a goodly time of our lives trying to evade him. It, of course, all goes back to our first parents in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve did the only thing God told them not to do, they were ashamed, and the big cover-up began. Sewed for themselves clothing out of fig leaves. What a feeble attempt that was. First time they sit down, it's going to be Splitsville. And then when God comes calling upon them in the cool of the night, cool of the day, what do they do but hide, try to hide? And we've been doing it ever since. But the problem is that it just doesn't work. Didn't work for Adam and Eve, doesn't work for us either. It just doesn't work. And our psalmist for this day, David, in Psalm 32, tells us why. Let me share again those words. He says, when I kept silence, when I kept it all in, when I covered my sins over, shoved them under the rug, as it were, then my body wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I was in misery. I was in misery when I tried to avoid you, Lord, when I tried to hide from you, when I tried to run away from you. I was in physical grief, says David. And it happens. It happens in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, he says. God didn't let up the pressure, and he doesn't let up the pressure on us either if we will not turn to him in, 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 in hope and prayer and confession. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and as a result, he says, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I was just totally wiped out. And that's what sin, if it isn't confessed, if it's hidden away, that's what sin does to you. Messes you up in your head, in your heart, your emotions, your mind, and of course, above all, messes you up spiritually. It plays out its, its rotten fruit in your life. It's just as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. And because of it, of course, we are dying bit by bit by bit, day by day by day. The great psychiatrist, Carl Menninger, who is, was head of, for many years, the head of the famed Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, claimed that fully 75% of his patients could be cured if somehow they could get rid of their guilt. We all bear it, and it, it devastates us, whether we realize it or not. In fact, especially when we don't realize it, it devastates us. 
And that's why it just doesn't work to hide ourselves away from our God. As the psalmist goes on to tell us, it's only as we fess up, open up to who and what we are, confess to what we have done, confess not only that we've done wrong, but we, in a very real sense, in the deepest parts of our being, are wrong, out of whack with our God. It's only as we do that that we find help, that we find relief. Listen also to what our psalmist says. When I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity, I said, I will, tran I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the, the guilt of my sin. Only then was there relief. And only then is there relief for you and for me as well. As we come to our God and freely admit who and what we are, who and what we have done that, ashame, that shames us also, the things that keep us awake at night, that go way back, only as we lay it all in his lap is there help, is there hope, is there freedom. Because he alone is the only one who can take away sin. You know, all of sin ultimately is sin against God. All our faults, our mistakes, our failings, our shortcomings, those are sins against God. David, the psalmist, the writer of Psalm 32, he recognized that very well. As he tells us in Psalm 51, which we'll hearing, be hearing about in a couple of weeks from today, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, his neighbor's wife, and then mur murdered that neighbor, Uriah, one of his trusted generals, in order to cover it up, then he began to realize how much grief he bore, how much pain and sorrow and suffering he was enduring. But his psalm of confession is Psalm 51. And when he lays it all out before the Lord, what he ends up saying is, against you, you only have I sinned, O Lord, and done this evil in your sight. All of our sin is always sin against God. And only he can take it away. And he does take it away. We're hearing the story played out in the passion narrative as it was read to us just this, this day. Played out in all its depth and detail. How God's own son came into this world and took upon himself our shape, our form, our humanity. And how he went to a cross and to a grave for our sakes. The whole bloody story laid out, and he did it all for you and for me because of our sin. When he went to that cross, he took our sin upon himself, yours and mine, and bore it to the cross. But he didn't just carry it to the cross, he carried it away. He did it in. He overcame it. He defeated it. That cross killed him, but he killed your sin and mine on that cross. Took it away for good forever, no matter how, good, how great that sin may be. Wiped it out entirely. He erased it for us. And that's the gift that is ours in him. And that is why, as the psalmist says, when I acknowledge my sin to you and did not hide my iniquity, when I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. It's as St. John the Apostle tells us in his very first epistle. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, he says. We're not fooling God, we're fool fooling only me. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the gift, the wondrous gift that is ours, yours and mine, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's, in fact, 
so important, this forgiveness of sins, so important that it's a part of our catechism, the very heartbeat of our faith, the forgiveness of sins. We heard of it, we confessed it in the words of the catechism this day. The office of the keys and confession, it's called which is that special power which our Lord has given to his church on earth to forgive sins, to forgive the sins of the penitent sinners and to let those who are unrepentant know that there is no forgiveness. And that's even as our Lord has said, as he told his disciples, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. And that's the power that he has given to his church. And that power gets played out most every Sunday as we gather here for worship. And we say for all to hear, mostly ourselves, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, Lord. And we hear the wondrous, freeing words spoken back to us by the pastor. Your sins are forgiven you in the name of Jesus Christ who suffered and died for you. And that frees us up. That makes us alive. That's the only thing that can truly make us alive here and now and for all eternity. Leslie Weatherhead, the the great English pastor, psychologist, said that the forgiveness of God is the most powerfully therapeutic idea in the world more than just an idea, however. It's the real thing. It's the real thing because Christ Jesus died for you and me. He rose again for you and me, offered himself up for us all, for each and every one of us, overcame our sin and gives us life through his resurrection. There indeed is healing and hope and help for us. And millions Millions across the centuries have found that help and that hope. Not by running away from God, but by running to God. Not by hiding from him, but hiding in him. In him who loves us and gave himself for us. I'd like to tell you about one of those people. His name was Francis Thompson. Francis Thompson lived in the previous century. In fact, he died at the end of that last century, 1907. He was only 46 years old. But he lived a pretty rough and rugged life. He was a drug addict and spent his life on the streets. Street person, we would call him today. And he wrote a poem talking about those years on the streets that he spent addicted to drugs. It's one of the great Christian classics an epic poem that goes on for pages. It's entitled, The Hound of Heaven. And you can just guess who that hound of heaven is. The Lord God himself, who came running after him and finally caught him. Let me share you some of the words of that poem. Thompson said, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot, precipitated down titanic glooms of chasm fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace. Deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat more instant than the feet. And the voice said, all things betray thee who betrayest me. Well, Thompson was taken in by a a dedicated Christian couple, the Minels they were named. And they nursed him back from his drug addiction and emaciated self. But most of all, they introduced him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that made all the difference in the life of Francis Thompson. He became a new person, a new man, because of the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he discovered that that one for, from whom he had been running through most of his life was really the one whom he had been seeking. And when he found him, or rather to put it the other way around, when the Lord found him, then he became a new person. He found life. And so do we. So do you and I. The place for you and I to be running is not from God, but to God. And when we play our hide-and-seek games, as we continue to do, let's make sure we don't hide from God, but rather in him, because he is the one who loves us and gave himself for us and promises us the forgiveness of each and every one of our sins. And it's because of him that, as the psalmist says in our closing verse, we can be glad in the Lord and rejoice and shout for joy. We can have peace and hope and everlasting gladness in him. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.